All right, here we are at the Joe Wentz Project TV, and we got uh, R2, R3, Lock and Nut on the scene. What's going on, man? What's happening, brother? How are good you doing, you, man? It's I'm good doing to... okay, man. I'm doing okay for, for a strategy. Yeah, <laughs> strategy. That's right, man. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. And uh, there's a few things I want to touch on uh, – uh, touch on with you here since uh, you uh, put up a video shortly uh, just a little while ago of a beautiful guitar. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, and now let me just ask you this uh, for people who are watching this right now. This is uh, we're doing this on a uh, platform called Zoom. Now uh, Google Hangouts has canceled for whatever reason. We don't know. So we're doing this pre-recorded, and this is being shown as a premiere which you're watching right now. And I'd like to thank R2 for taking the time to be here. Uh, this is a Saturday evening. And uh, thank you. Thank you again, R2, for being here on such short notice, man. Thank you very much for well, taking the time. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me on. I Absolutely. appreciate that. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Now, I'd like to ask you a few things, man. It's been a long time since we've done kind of a, a little hangout deal together. Yeah. Um, how many strats do you have? How many Stratocasters do you have? Uh, let's see. I have the Fender Stratocaster there that I bought about a year ago. That's the uh, U U.S. Uh, Stratocaster Special. Um, I have a Warmoth body. Uh, that's kind of a Fender Strat because I use my 1989 Made in Japan Fender Stratocaster neck, and I bought a Warmoth body and uh, customized it, and I have that one. I don't break that out too often because right now the frets are worn out. Oh, so it, it needs a fret job. So, yeah, that's uh, retirement. And the other Strat is the my first guitar ever. It's an Epiphone Strat copy from back in the late late eighties. So, oh. if you want to say three Strats, but one official Stratocaster for sure. And yes. and that is a beautiful Strat, I might add. It's a uh, isn't it like a. a what is it like a ice blue or yeah, something? Yeah, they call it uh, Sonic Blue. Sonic Thunder calls blue. it Sonic Blue, and Sonic the blue, pickguard yeah. is a mint uh, pickguard that they used to use back in the day that has like a weird tint to it, and that contrast with the uh, rosewood neck is just oh, I, I fell in love that with that when I was in high school uh, when I was into Inve Malmsteen. I remember I I bought a guitar for the practicing musician magazine. Oh, and uh, you know, I know you remember those magazines. Oh, absolutely, and, yeah. And I bought it. I didn't even get a chance to read it. And I brought it, bought it, uh, brought it on the bus with me and, uh, on the way to high school. And I opened up one, just the first page I opened up, and there's a picture of Inve Malmsteen holding a classic 62 Fender Stratocaster Sonic Blue with that mint green pick guard, the, uh, the uh, rosewood fretboard, and I fell in love with it. I mean, I said, one of these days – Look how long it took me. I want to have that guitar. It's not the exact one, but I couldn't find Fender. If you wanted that Sonic Blue for a Fender Stratocaster, you would have to order it through the custom shop. Mm -hmm. And, whew, yeah, that's a pretty penny right there. It was a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I went with the U.S. Uh, US made, which is still slightly expensive, but not like your custom shop, but, uh, yeah, I love that bad boy. It's, uh, it's unique. It's, uh, has the Texas, uh, special pickups. That's the, uh, the same that the SRV model comes with. Yeah. I believe. It, you, you get that. It's, that tone. That, yeah, yeah. That Stevie Ray Vaughan tone for yeah, sure. That my son just got a SRV model a few months ago. And, uh, Oh yeah. I used to have that. And, um, and then I gave it to him, and then a lot, quite a few years went by. I was like, man, I, I wonder if he'll trade me, if I can get that back, if he'll trade me. <laughs> and, uh, that's and pretty cool time, that you can trade with your boy with that, oh, you know? Oh, yeah, he, he has, man, I don't know how many. Because didn't you get your Zach Wild uh, Epiphone back? Yeah, yeah that, was, that was mine originally, and, I, I, yeah. again, we traded uh, something. I don't know. He had a guitar that I liked, and uh, when he got older, he, he was like, all right, Dad, we'll trade, but – you know, I want two of, I got my own two of your guitars if you want this one. And I was like, man, you drive a hard bargain. You know, so <laughs> yeah. I had to trade him two guitars to get the Zach Wild model back. I can't remember, what was it? A Satch, a Joe Satrione, a JS100. Uh, it wasn't the original. Um, right. I wish I still had the original JS100 I got back in the, um, was that the like, was that like the late 90s? 
yeah. or early 2000. And I got it from a guy off eBay and it was in mint condition. He even sent me a letter and said, if you ever want to get rid of this, I'll buy it back from you. Man, that guitar was pristine. It was gorgeous. And nice. uh, my dumb ass, I sold it uh, many years later as I needed the money. And um, so I was like, well, I want to get another one of those. So I went on American Musical and found a JS100, same color, candy apple red, ordered it, got it to mail. And I was like, this thing seems different. And yeah. uh, they had sharp fret edges on it. So what happened was they started manufacturing those somewhere else in another factory for, uh, with cheap parts. And what was sad was that guitar, I still paid, I think it was like, what, 750 when yeah. I got the JS100 the second time. And uh, it had the sharp fret edges, had this, this uh, cheap uh, tremolo. And I was like, it looks like the old one, but that's not, that's something. Yeah. Different. You know, and yeah. it wouldn't All stay. All parts are. Yeah, it wouldn't quality. It, it wouldn't stay in tune. The pickups were really weak, and yeah. um, so uh, the, I, I traded him that, and he's on hot riding it up now. He got a fret job done on it. He put new pickups in it, so it's like you know the first JS one hundred I had, right? There you go. Yeah. And uh, so he, I traded him that, and uh, I think it was a Telecaster uh, for that uh, Zach Wild Epiphone. And uh, but when he when he had the SRV for a while, I said, man would you want to trade if I can get that back? And he's like, all right. So I traded him two guitars and, uh, I got it back. And, um, lo and behold, hard times would hit again. And that was the only guitar I had at the time that was American made that I knew would bring in uh, some money. Yeah. Of course, of course, you don't never get what you paid. You know, you're, you're exactly. lucky to get half, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, even if you customize it and upgrade, you, yeah, kinda, it yeah. doesn't really do anything for the, for the three sale. It really doesn't, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> So I sold it um, and uh, to a guy, I think I got seven fifty for it. And um, so I took the money and we paid some bills and I had to work on my, uh, I had a Ford Ranger back then and uh, had to get some parts for it. Got it fit, got it up and running, but I was broke. But, it, you know, and I accomplished what I set out to do, but I had to sell it to get the money. And that's what was bad. But anyway, he remembered that guitar and then, I guess about three or four months ago, he ordered him one. Uh, he finally got his account going on AMS where he's building up a little bit of good rapport with the, yeah, with the company. Right. You know? Yeah. And uh, so he's got one now. And he said, I've got these payments for a year. I said, yeah, welcome to the family. You know what I mean? So <laughs> nice, man. But he, he brought it out. Um, I went to his house, I guess, I don't know, a month or so ago. I, I went to get something. I help him with something or do something. And he's, he said, hang on. Man. He went and brought it out to me and he handed it to me. And I said, man, I remember this thing. And, uh, he still got that SRV strap that I gave to him years ago. It's that white strapped SRV had had the three notes on it. Yeah. Yeah. And the big wide leather strap. I didn't like it cause it felt like it was cutting into the side of my neck cause it was so wide, you know? And, uh, I gave it to him. I paid like $65 for that strap. I let him have it. I said, here you go. I can't, I'm not going to use it. He's got that strap on there, and uh, he plugged up, man, to his uh, amp. He's got a a Line Six Spider Four. He's got like this little Stevie tone dialed in, or John Mayer tone actually. And he sat there, man, and he played, and man, that thing sounded sweet. You know, I said, "You got it down, boy. You got it." But yeah, yeah everybody needs a strap, man. Oh yeah. Oh God. Yeah. My first my <laughs> first guitar was a Strat knockoff in '86. It was a a Strat knockoff by a company called Memphis of all things. And I never heard of that brand anywhere. And I, and I watched a, uh, I think it was a video with Zach wild, man. And I think his first guitar, no, I'm sorry. Not Zach wild. I apologize. Slash. It was slash yeah. slash talked about his first guitar and it was made by Memphis. And I said, Holy crap. That's the first time I've heard of that name. You know, uh, <laughs> I didn't think nobody else had it. Yeah. You know, I think nobody had it. And I was like, Oh, Slash's first guitar was a Memphis. That's why so was mine. I didn't I didn't think that name even got around to anybody, you know, but it's pretty cool, man. But yeah. So I want to get now to your uh the video that you just posted was of a beautiful dime bag girl dean model. The uh yeah. what's it called? A razor razor bag or razor razor back, yeah. Man, talk about that if you don't mind. That was gorgeous. Yeah, that Dean Razorback. Um, before Dimebag Daryl passed away, he passed away in 2004. I had a Washburn uh, uh, Dimebag signature. 
um, that I was thinking of getting rid of once again. Didn't want to, but times are tough and you need some money. And I knew, like you said, that would be the guitar to bring in the cash. Um, and a buddy of mine always eyeballed that thing. He always came over and wanted to play it. And just always loved it. And then when it came down to it, he was the first guy I called. So I sold him that Washburn. And um, Dimebag passed away. And, of course, those Washburns became now, of course, sought after. Because he left that company well, when he was alive and went to Dean and started building the relationship with Dean Zelensky again when he was the owner of the, of the company. Um, so with his passing away, I, was, uh, I wanted to fill the void. And I was a, at that time, I was a big, big Dimebag Daryl fan. Mm. And um, so anyways, I, uh, I wanted to buy a Dean guitar, and Dean was building a, uh, a signature guitar limited run that uh, uh, Dimebag designed. And the story was is that uh, they painted it this rust metal. It was like a metal guitar. And it was the airbrushed as the, uh, the metal was rusting. And okay. Dimebag designed this shape, which is basically the shape of the ML uh, that he's known for, which is half of the Explorer and half of B. Mm. And uh, the body shape, I mean. Okay. And, uh, which Dean calls the ML. And uh, so he just sharpened it up, made points on it, made these edges on it. Anyways... I called up uh, an official USA Dean uh, store and, uh, and I said, I want to order up one of these guitars. And the guy told me, he goes, we don't even know what it looks like. It's like a secret. Even the dealers don't know what it is. Wow. He goes, I can put an order in. He goes, I already put an order in for two of them and I can put one aside for you, but you have to put X amount of money down. And I'm like, so, wow. so uh, I waited a couple months and I didn't get it until 2000. Five, uh, mid 2005 and uh, yeah I've had it ever since and it's just one of those guitars that I keep in the, uh, the closet if you want to say it's you, I only pull it out every once in a while and, and jam and special, uh, special occasions only special yeah. occasions I used to pull it out every Sunday just to just kind of just pull it out of the case and, yeah. and that thing man I don't know it just it never goes out of tune it never goes out of tune. I rarely have to tune that thing. And I, what I do is when I keep it in the case, I keep the locking nut unlocked. Um, so it has a chance to breathe and move and so forth. Right. And it, it, it's been working fine for all these years doing that. Just not, not, I lock it when I'm playing it, obviously, and start doing you know your whammy bar tricks and so forth. But when I have it uh, sleeping, resting in the closet, I... <laughs> I leave it unlocked, but yeah, I wanted to, um, I was listening to the song Floods from Pantera, and uh, I pulled that guitar case uh, out, and I put it on my bed, and I grabbed my phone, and I started filming away, and I go, you know what, I want, uh, I've never seen anybody put a video on YouTube, I don't see anybody, if you, you can look, I mean, you look up Dean Razorback, you'll probably find a handful of people playing these things, um, reason right. being, they're rare. Um, were quite expensive. Now I'm sure it's been fluctuating so forth because you know, only uh, the problem with those kind of guitars is you have to be obviously a dime bag Dean and Pantera fan. Um, mm -hmm. if not, then it's just a nice guitar, and if you were to sell it, people would be like, "Yeah, no thanks. I'll buy a Les Paul or something." <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> But I still love it, man. So I, I had to like break it out and I, I, I strummed it and I go, man, I played it for a little bit, put it back in the case and I filmed it. And, and uh, I didn't realize the video was that long. And so I was kind of bouncing around with certain individuals and asking them, what do you think? Should I post this? Should I do this? And, and everyone's like, put it out. Oh my goodness. Put it out because everybody's got to see the paint job on this thing. And I go, it doesn't do it justice. You got to see it in person. But, yeah, I, I had to put it out. I, I was like, i got to release it. Today's the day. I was going to put it out yesterday. I made it yesterday. But, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for watching. Oh, Joe yeah. And commenting and everybody that, out there. Thank that, you. That was an awesome video. I love it. I was like, oh, man. And uh, what really got me was uh, I've never played one of those type of guitars. But 
what I really caught my eye was the headstock, how it has Dimebag's yeah. uh, face on it and all that. I was like, oh, man, look at that. That was that was cool. But the paint job was incredible. I was like, my God, that guitar looks good. You know, and it was yeah. – uh, I was like, man. Yeah. yeah, it comes with a certificate of authenticity. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to make – the number that was supposed to be is Dime, Dimebag's favorite number was the number three. And they were going to make uh, 333 of them. Oh, okay. And they were going to they were going to put on the certificate one out of you know 333, two out of 333. But uh, I think what wound up happening is they never made it to that number. I really don't know the exact number they made. I want to say just slightly over a hundred. Oh, really? Eh, yeah. Hmm. Um, dude, just because it was that one artist doing all the guitars and he oh. had to do them by hand. It was all oh. airbrushed. Okay. So it wasn't anything that they could silk screen or paint or uh, factory paint and just keep the assembly line going. So, uh, um, yeah, that was uh, Dean Zielinski said that they had to cut the number uh, down just due to the, the expense of the uh, artist, the paint, and just the time and uh but uh, not too long after that i think dean zelinski sold the company um but with that certificate that i have uh, the original owner of dean signed it so that's another piece that i like to keep and uh, absolutely yeah val value to me I, I just to me it just seems so cool that you know dimebag had a relationship with the original owner of the company because they kind of went away for a little while. And the reason why uh, uh, Dime went back with Dean is because the uh, contract ended with Washburn. And oh. he loved his Washburn custom shops, but he wasn't too sure that, to renew because when he found out that Dean Zielinski bought the company back again and he was going to redo it. And so it brought him back to his childhood because the story of Dean is that he, he won his first Dean guitar. Well, he actually bought a Dean guitar that his dad bought him. But he won the Dean, the, the Dean that you guys see is the, the blue lightning bolt one, is the one that he won from the contest, the oh. guitar contest when he was like a kid, a teenager. Okay. And so uh, he customized it, obviously, routed it out and put a Floyd Rose on it. And then that's where he started doing all this, you know, the dime bag trickery, you want to call it. And uh, he actually got a chance to meet Dean Zielinski as a, before he got famous and he actually showed Dean Zielinski that Dean guitar that he won because I think Dean remembered him from the guitar contest because there was Dean hosting the contest and uh, he showed Dean Zielinski look what I did to the guitar and when Dean Zielinski saw like what did you do his exact words was quote unquote what did you do to my guitar because when Dimebag had it it had the string through like a V brass plate with the yeah. string through kind of like the Gibson style, but, right. um, uh, but he took that off. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, routed it out and put himself a Floyd Rose on there. And, uh, uh, rest is history right there. Wow. <laughs> That's but cool. Then again, I could be wrong. And so this is something that I heard reading and so forth. And, Right. I'm sure there might be other stories out there, but uh, that's the best of my knowledge is what I know from the history of that. That's cool, man. I'm glad you still have that guitar. That's something, like I said, something to hold on to. That's a sharp guitar, man. That is awesome. Yeah, it's It's got some good tone. It's good tone, I think. Another guitar that I see you play once in a while that I really like is, uh, I want to say, is it a your Charvel, the natural wood color with oh, the yeah. with the brass hardware, gold hardware, man, it is. Yeah, that is, man, that is tight, man. Yeah, that's another uh, custom shop. That's from the Music Zoo. The Music Zoo is a uh, okay music store in New York, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's a great, great music store. Their customer service is just awesome. Um, uh, my wife actually bought that guitar for me. It's something that I wanted. I saw when I first saw those, I fell in love with it and I kept on talking about it. And anyways, uh, long story short, my, uh, <laughs> my wife was emailing the uh, owner of the store and said that she wanted to buy this. And, uh, I, I, I think back and I remember because she would pull up the, the, the pictures from the website. And she would ask me, she goes, which one do you like better? 
Mm-hmm. And I used to be like, what? What? What are you doing on that website looking at that guitar? And what, it, and what they would do is kind of like what Sweetwater does is where they put the, let's say if they have three of them, mm-hmm. they'll put the pictures of all three of them, show you the serial numbers, show you the front and back, and then you can say which one you liked. And I remember saying, I want this one because the serial number is close to my, <laughs> my birth year and I like the way this looks. And she's like, yeah. oh, okay, good to know. And I was like, that's it? Okay. You know. <laughs> <laughs> didn't think anything of it man until <laughs> all of a sudden i see this big rectangular box in the living room and bam. This, was in, this was in 2007 oh and okay. uh yeah I, I remember that because uh that was the last year that i bought or my wife or and i bought it and purchased a, a guitar okay. um because then for 10 years no musical gear was bought Oh, um, for I, 10 I, years. Wow. For 10 years, man. I played, uh, I still played, obviously. I played that guitar and I played all my other guitars, my Dean, my Jackson. But uh, that's when everything was just more uh, work and family time. And just that was just put on the back burner of just as a hobby. And, right. and I was uh, really close. Uh, 10 years later, in 2017, um, that's when I started going back onto YouTube. And uh, then I started seeing other people with a passion of guitars and love for the guitars and gear. And I went, wait a minute, man, there's still people out there like me. Yeah. <laughs> we still love it, man. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, cause I, around here, uh, my, like my friends that were obsessed at like I was, were they moved on, moved to another state and so forth. And right. Right. I, you know, and then you, of course you meet new friends, but you go, Oh man, you ever guys ever play a Charvel? And they're like, what's a Charvel? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I've, I've heard of Fender. Yeah. You know, but it, <laughs> they don't, but they no don't. one ever, no one ever played guitar. So it was like, it was like a lost, uh, lost art that yeah. I couldn't find anybody else to, uh, mm-hmm. to share that passion with. And then YouTube came around and that was 2017. And yeah. then, uh, I think the first guitar I bought, was the Wolfgang standard Wolf, Wolfgang. Yeah. I, yeah. I went to a guitar center. It was uh, my birthday and bam, I saw it. And I actually went in there to go get the, uh, the, the Sterling sub. Yes. Yes. I the one that you have. Yeah. I remember that. And then, uh, you w- got a good deal on that, uh, Wolfgang. I mean, yeah, I saw that Wolfgang, and I'm like two hundred ninety nine dollars, two ninety nine ninety eight out the door with a free gig <laughs> bag too. I would have nabbed it up. Oh, the it only up. thing that was missing was the whammy bar. Yeah, the but actual, that's, that's but easy. That's deep. I went like, you know what? I'm not gonna complain about it. Uh, uh-uh. no. I was so focused on the way it played, the way it looked, mm-hmm. um, the price. I'm like that. Yeah. It didn't dawn on me until I went home, and I went. Where the heck's the whammy bar? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I had spare parts from, right. you know, from previous guitars of uh, German oh, yeah. Floyd Rose and Schallers. Mm. And oh, yeah. I, I put a black one on there because I, I, I upgraded that thing. I put uh, new parts on her. I put a 1984 German Floyd Rose on it with brass tuning, tuners, fine tuners that are built in it. It's a brass block in the back. I put mm. a German Floyd Rose locking nut on it and... Believe it or not, that thing just sounds just more alive. The uh, the stock stuff sounded great. This thing just sustains. And I made a video about that uh, with that guitar not too long ago, uh, mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago, where I'm actually playing a note, and that thing can just – I can probably hold on to it for a long time, and that thing would ring right. out. Well, you did the, the video where you're doing uh, Everybody Wants Some by Van Halen. Oh, for the, the Charvel, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're playing that. I remember that. And I was oh, like, man, that yeah. was awesome, man. I was like, he's got that tone. And I forgot, I briefly, you know, had a uh, momentary lapse in memory. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. He's got that Yamaha THR 10X now. Dude, so, that thing is awesome, man. Yeah, that let, me, thing let, is let me hear your awesome. thoughts on that. Yeah, because I'm telling you, man. Oh, my God. I that, like, that changed everything. I yeah, mean, it's a, it's I, a game I'm, changer. I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. And the thing is, is that with, uh, I didn't believe it, but with different guitars, it reacts differently than the, the different channels on there. Um, but the, the brown, 
sound is it the brown one there's a brown one and a brown two right i believe it's called or it's called brown sound one brown sound two um on that uh everybody wants some it's that brown one it's that classic old van halen kind of marshall kind of sound Uh with you just dial in the right amount of reverb and decay on there and it boom I it, it it influenced me to play it. I said this reminds Absolutely. me so much of everybody wants some, and uh, yeah, I wanted to play that tune so bad because that a- was uh, that was a tune that my, I remember my brother um, my brother had to take care of me and watch it. By the way, my brother's uh, it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Julian! Oh, um, happy birthday, man! <laughs> yeah, right. he uh, he's seven years older than me, but when we were younger, he had to take care of me and watch me. And my mom would be like, you know, you're babysitting. But uh, he would, uh, my parents would leave and he'd be like, hey, listen, you stay, sit tight here. Don't, don't burn the house down. I'm going to go visit my girlfriend. Mm. <laughs> Everybody so, wants some. <laughs> <laughs> so while he's out with his girlfriend, I was left with these eight tracks. And I had, uh, you believe that, eight tracks, man. And I still have them. Uh, Van Halen. Two, he left me with. He, I remember him going, Here's some ACDC. I had ACDC, Back in Black, Led Zeppelin, Physical Graffiti, and uh, Van Halen, uh, yeah, Led Zeppelin Two, and Van Halen, uh, Women and Children First. And uh, I remember when he gave me that A track, and I remember seeing the cover, and it was a small picture of Women and Children First, and I popped that A track in. You basically had to click through the, all the buttons on there to get a song. You couldn't rewind. You couldn't fast forward to a song. You just basically had to find a track. And uh, when I first heard that dive bomb that he did in the beginning of that song, that yeah. Whirl, that yeah. growl, yeah, I as a kid, and I had headphones on too, and I sat there and I go, "What is that?" <laughs> yeah, I mean. Eruption, everything that was great. I remember where I was with eruption, but when I heard "Woman and uh, Children First, Everybody Wants Some," that guitar tone, those dive bombs, I oh, didn't, man. I could not believe that a guitar could do that. I love and, that uh, album. I love that. Love album. it. Man. Love that album. I so love bad. it, man. I can sit there and listen to uh, that and uh, just all those songs. I can listen all to that it. stuff just yeah. all the time. And I'm like, man, this is this is where it's at right here. You know, it's just, uh, you could tell where, because, you know, Van Halen, as everybody knows now, R2 and I, we're huge Van Halen nuts anyway. And, but they were just, uh, I got a couple of audio books about them, but uh, I already knew this when I'm about to say I already knew it, but just for posterity, I'm going to say they were already a huge backyard band before they even got signed. I mean, they were doing huge backyard parties. They were doing the crazy, um, uh, shows they were doing self promotion on their shows and everything, and then so when they got signed, then they started going on tour. And they did, you know, uh, they were on their third album. They were pretty much seasoned. Hell, after the first album, they were seasoned. You know, they yeah. were they already knew the ropes pretty much. You know, as far as going out and touring and playing, but well, man, playing with Black Sabbath, you know, man, that was that was yeah, a- and then blowing them off the stage, man. I mean, yeah. it's, it's pretty wild when Ozzy says they these guys. Are blowing up. And they were pretty much done by that point anyway. Black Sabbath sure. was on their last leg, but still, uh, I mean, women and children first, man. Well, like I say, when you hear that, you can just hear everything just sounds more, I don't know, seasoned to me. It sounds more, everything just, I don't know. It's, it sounds awesome. I love that album. Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah, I had to put that out. That was a, a must for me. That was on my one of my to-do lists to always do a Van Halen tune. And uh, that was it right there. Oh God. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, where, where would music be without Van Halen? I mean, it would be, it wouldn't be nothing like it is today. Just think of how many things just, uh, Eddie by itself influenced as far as guitar playing. Right. I mean, it's just, uh, guitar playing wouldn't be where it is today without Eddie. Yeah. You know, it just, it wouldn't be absolutely. there. It wouldn't be absolutely. there. It wouldn't be there. You, even the uh, the gear that we have. Oh, uh, God, yeah. The innovations yeah. that he helped uh, come up with. I mean, he's he has to be credited with the uh, not only just the Floyd Rose system, but coming up with the idea of having those little fine tuners. Yeah. Because you got to uh, remember, because that Bumblebee that they just put out, 
the uh, you know uh, that reissue that twenty five thousand dollar bumblebee that that just came out. If you notice that Floyd Rose that's on there is an old original prototype Floyd Rose, where mm -hmm. it locks in the back, but there's no fine tuners. So once you have that thing locked in, I don't know how they did it. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> I don't either. I mean, you got to <laughs> think when you hear 1980 and Women and Children First, he had that uh, locking nut system. Mm -hmm. On the other albums, I think he was still using the vintage style. Yeah, could be wrong. Yeah, I think you're be right. Wrong. Because if you notice on that Women and Children First, that's why what I mean about that growl. That Floyd Rose is the only way you can do that dive all the way down to the body and hear those strings just flap back and forth and then all of a sudden you bring it back up the pitch like nothing ever happened. Yeah. You try, you try that with a vintage Fender Floyd Rose, man, and mine just, just goes, ring. Yeah. It, it ain't. <laughs> I like, it, that cat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he, like I said, he had it down, man. He had it down to a science how to, on that, uh, you know, that first album with that tremolo because it wasn't a locking system he was able to dive bomb it and bring it back up or whatever and just i mean he had can you imagine it after he finally got everything no pun intended fine-tuned with the floyd rose and all that he didn't have to do those little tricks no more because everything stayed in pitch so he probably yeah. had to retrain himself to exactly. a degree you know say oh i don't have to do that no more i'm so used to doing that you know what i mean it's like getting out of a car that has a a stick and you're always pressing with your left foot for the clutch and you get an automatic and you go to press you're like, Oh, there's not a clutch in here. You know, it's just, I do that. I used to do that all the time. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing. And then, and that's, I remember reading in the magazine a long time ago when I was a kid and I still remember this, that we, he, they would ask people, what, how did you guys back in the late seventies? Cause you had a guy of Uli John Roth from the Scorpions and uh, he would do these dive bombs, and he played a Fender Stratocaster, an old-school, mid-'70s Stratocaster, and he did these dive bombs, and he would be in tune, and Eddie was impressed with that. And I think it was the whole oiling, the, uh, putting the, you know, the, the lube on the, the nut and stretching the strings out, and, and Eddie would say that he always had a tendency and a habit that he got used to that once he did that dive bomb, he would always pull back up on the bar or put his palm on the bar on the bridge to bring it back to mm -hmm. hopefully bring it back to a pitch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started doing that when, even on my Floyd roses, I would notice that when I would play, sometimes you'll see me, my hand go back to kind of push the bridge back a little bit because it does help bring it back to pitch. If you want to call it, hmm. so it's just these little techniques that you kind of realize on certain guitars. I, I have to do it. Not all the time. But you dive down, especially if you're bringing it down all the way. I noticed that I kind of have to catch myself to it. I don't have to on a Charvel, but I was doing it anyways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was watching back in the video. I go, I'm, I'm doing that thing. I'm doing that thing where I'm pressing back, thinking yeah. that it's not going to be back in tune. Because I was afraid. Because I'm like, I got to do this in one take. <laughs> I got to right. just do this right through. <laughs> I can't stop. I don't want to edit. I don't want to, you know, I want to just go all the way through. And so I was catching right. myself doing those old Eddie technique. So that's why I bring that up because I'm like, you're so used to doing something and then you don't have to do it anymore, but you're still doing it. So I wonder if Eddie's doing what you're saying is that, you know, like, was is he still doing those techniques pre Floyd Rose fine tuners and locking nut and mm -hmm. yeah, man. Eddie's the Eddie's the man. Yeah. He's I, the man. I would uh really love to hear some new material. I don't know. I've kind of been out of the loop of the whole Van Halen thing, Tate of Truth here lately. So I don't know. I don't, I don't think know. there's going to be any new material. I, well, I say new material from the vault. I think that's uh, what we might hear. I think it's stuff that you'll see that Eddie maybe recorded or put out, but never released. Mm. That's what I'm thinking. I think Wolfgang is going to take care of that. But for some reason, I don't know. I don't know what Eddie's holding out on, man. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't know. I've like I said, I've kind of been out of the loop on that. But uh, uh, either way, I mean, either way, I'm I'm happy with what's out. What we all have, the music that's sure. there from the Roth and Hagar era. Um, uh, I love both eras. I mean, uh, you can't touch those first albums with Dave. I mean, they're classic. Uh, but then when you get to the Hagar stuff, I was that's when I got into them. Was in '86 when Hagar first joined them, and uh I was hearing, uh, well, I was hearing dreams on the radio 
And I didn't know at the time, I didn't know that. I thought it was just another Sammy Hagar song. I didn't know it was Van Halen, you know, cause I wasn't, I wasn't even into that. You know, I was, it wasn't until, yeah. pardon me, it wasn't until <clears throat> the summer of 86 when I would start, you know, my uh, whole demeanor would change as far as music and guitar and all that. And, um, but I didn't know, you know, we'd be up at the lake and the, they had a jukebox back then. Go figure. People like, what's a jukebox? You know, and, yeah. and, uh, if you go to Waffle House, you'll see one. <laughs> but, and, um, so, yeah, my wife's parents have a jukebox still in their, their basement. Oh, do they? oh that's yeah. awesome. And, uh, but we'd be up there shooting pool when I was, you know, 16 years old at the lake. And you'd hear dreams come on the jukebox. And I thought, there's that Sammy Hagar song again or whatever. And somebody's like, no, nah, man, that's Van Halen. And I was like, that don't sound, what? Like, Van, that don't sound <laughs> like Van Halen. I, and not that I was really keeping notes. You know, I was just like, really? That don't sound like Van Halen that I'm – and they said, no, nah, they got a new singer. I was like, oh, okay. And I just, you know, whew, just forgot all about yeah. it. You know, I was like, okay. And then what until later? And I, you know, I was like, man, they sound awesome. Got that first album, that 5150. And then I went back and that's when I got Van Halen 1, 2, When My Children First, Farrell Warren. You know, I started getting them and I was like, my God, it was just constant uh, cassettes rotating them in and out every week or so in my car. Just, man, I could, man. You talk about just a barrage, and I was like, "How is this guy playing this?" Yeah, I didn't, that's I didn't cool, even know how, I didn't even know how to do a chord. Then I was like, you know, I was just, I was like, hey, "Is he doing this by himself, or is there what's going on?" You know, uh, but yeah, and see, so, and that's cool, man. That's cool that you appreciate at that time that it came out. I was the opposite, you know, with my brother being seven years older than me, he turned me on to the, all the old classic Van Halen. When it, by the time David Lee Roth left. My brother was – my brother was in the Marines at the time, and he came back with that Steve Vai uh, – eat him uh, – I'm sorry, David Lee Roth with Steve Vai, eat him and smile. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, man, this is the guy that replaced Van Halen. And my brother was like, you got to check this out, man. And that's when Eddie went to do 5150. Mm -hmm. And with the crowd of people that I was hanging out with my friends, of course, they're all diehard David Lee Roth, Van Halen fans, and my brother and I and everything, we were like, ah. So all that Van Halen, 5150 era, that Sammy Hagar, I put it on the back burner, man. I didn't give it a chance, and I, and I, I regret it. You know, I, I tell everybody it wasn't until just recently in this decade that I started getting back into the Van Halen and it was almost new to me, you know, I still, you start like almost rediscovering a different Eddie. And I went, Oh my goodness. Why did I not listen to this <laughs> back in the eighties, man? My ignorance, man. But that's, wow. I mean, a lot of people did that. Oh yeah. But I, I, I'm oh, yeah. glad that I, I opened up my, uh, you know, my mind to it and, uh, and gave it a chance. And I'm glad I did because oh yeah, I, I started putting, I put out some videos with some songs on there from the, Sammy Hagar era, and uh, I, I feel like a kid again. You know, it was just like, wow, this is great. The detune, the chorusy sound. You know, I was like, this is awesome, man. And once again, Eddie's just strong writing abilities, and yeah. uh, they made magic, man. They made magic. So him, him and Sammy I were. I've always thought that him and Sammy worked really well together. Yeah. And and uh, it's sad, you know. I think but it wasn't. I believe the story goes that Sammy was supposed to be the replacement for them back in the day. Well, what it was before they, was, before they signed. I mean, yeah, I mean, you would know. The story that I heard was now. This is what I heard. I haven't done no research or nothing. But what I heard was uh, Ted Templeman has always been the legendary producer for Van Halen. Right? He right. gets them in the studio to start working on the first album, and he comes to you know mike eddie and alex and says look this guy just can't sing and uh i'm working with another guy his name's sammy hagar what if i talk to his people and we get him in here to sing on this and they was like no nah, we've already we we know what we're doing and of course uh, you know really it's it's good that it worked out that way because we we might not have what we have today if that exactly. would have happened back then it, i mean you know what i'm saying and just like it in back to the future the doc says, if you go back in time and you mess with that era of time, it's going to disrupt the future, which, the you, know, thing, which, yeah. which you know, now is the future. It's going to be different, you know, not to get, yep. all, you know, Marty McFly on you or nothing, but, <laughs> but, 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 you know, like my, my dad always said, there's a reason for everything. 
you know, you might not know or understand what that reason is at the time, but later down the road, you'll, it'll reveal itself why it's that way. And that's what I feel with the, the Sammy thing back then in 77, 78, whenever they started uh, on that first record. But um, so we were able to have the, the Roth era stuff, which was phenomenal. I mean, how can you not love that cool scream he always had? You know, with that, I mean, I was like, oh, my God, I, I don't hear nobody doing that. The closest person I heard that came to that was Prince, you know, every once in a blue moon. And then, uh, but then when that ended and Sammy got in the saddle and it was like, holy crap. When I heard Summer Nights, I was like, what the hell yeah. is that? You know, when you heard that, da, 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 and those pick yeah. slides. And I was like, I've never, never in my life, just the simplest thing is a pick slide. I've never heard no more cooler pick slide than Eddie Van Halen's pick it, slide. It just reminds you of summertime too, man, for some reason. It's yeah. Just, and it's, yeah. And, and I was just, and I tell you what song I started to get into just the intro, just, just the very beginning intro because the pick slide sounds so cool. And, and that's off their OU812 album, which was very cool because David Lee Ross album was Eat em and Smile. So Sammy and them come back with a, with a title that says, Oh, you ate one too? You know, just to kind of <laughs> mess with Dave and say, Oh, yeah, we got you, man. We got you. You know, and, uh, but off that album, Oh, you ate one too. It was a sucker in a three piece. If you're not familiar with that song, just go yeah. back on YouTube and just give it you know, the first 15, 20 seconds to listen, and you'll hear what I'm talking about with the, the cool pick slides and the, the horse winning and, you know, wah, 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 and all that. Man, I love, I was like, oh my God, I haven't heard this in forever. And that's one album that I listened to so much in my Chevy Cavalier back in, back in uh, <laughs> 87. That was, uh, oh man. I, I literally yeah. wore that tape out. He's and then seven. that was the, uh, that was the concert, my first Van Halen concert I went to was 0812. Went by myself, and they come out there, and they played. And, man, I was, man, I was hooting and hollering, and you'd think I was a damn crazy person. <laughs> the, the two guys beside me, they were older guys. You know, back then I was a teenager, so these guys were probably in their, in their early 30s. You know, but to me they were old, but they weren't old. You know, but one guy on my left, he was like this, looking around, you know. And then the guy on my right, he was like this. They were just still, I was like, you're at a Van Halen show. What is wrong with y'all? You know, and, and I was like, F it, man. I paid my money. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have a good time. You know, I was, oh, yeah. You know what I mean, oh, yeah. I didn't give a damn. I and, got you know, buddies like that too, man. I got buddies every show I go to with them. They're... Yeah, I'm like, there's no way, man. No. I mean, <laughs> I was like, uh oh, uh, man, come on, let your hair down. What are you guys, the bouncers or what's going <laughs> on here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right i said get out of here <laughs> it's like what but yeah that was uh that was and you know that was some great memories that was cool man i was able to see them in the, the ou812 tour and then again uh, some years would go by but the last time i saw him was on the uh uh the balance yeah the balance album when balance. I for that, oh, yeah. they, they came to charlotte that's where i was still living at the time and with my first wife and we went to uh back then it was called now listen to this back then it was called the blockbuster pavilion people now is like what is blockbuster yeah, you know you ask a kid now they're like they have no idea but uh that's what it was called back then i think now it's the i don't know verizon wireless amphitheater or so it might be something else i don't know but back then it was a blockbuster pavilion and we got there and then uh what was that band that came out and play open for them oh man they had was it driving and crying I think that's who it was. I think it was driving and crying. Yeah. Fly me courageous. Dun, dun, dun. Driving and crying. I remember that because they had that one big hit. And they came out and opened for Van Halen. And uh, oh. and then um, Whoopi Goldberg came out of all people. This is when she was still actually doing movies before she came uh, on that show. She uh, Whatever you want to call it that show she does now, whatever she was still doing movies back then. And she came out and she was good friends with Valerie Bertinelli. I think probably still is today. I don't know. And, uh, she came out and she goes, I want to introduce everybody to my friends, Eddie, Alex, Sammy, and Mike Van Halen. And they, they all started, you know, I thought that was cool. I was like, what the hell is Whoopi Goldberg doing here? In yeah, what the <laughs> you know, I was like, what the hell? And, and uh, but she was working on a movie and, uh, they come out and played. And I was like, man, it was so cool. That was the last time I seen them. And uh, I saw Dave Lee Roth. Uh, some more time would pass. Dave was doing his little solo thing. 
here and there. He still had the short hair, but he wasn't hitting on nothing as far as appearances. I remember he opened up. Now listen to this. He opened up for bad company and oh. uh, was here in town. It was a long time ago. I took, uh, where I used to work, there was a salesman that worked there and he was, he had VIP box seats at the, had their own box there that company did and um he wasn't going and he knew that i was a music guy so he let me have him which that salesman was a, he turned out to be a asshole anyway but at, at least i was you know he, you know he gave me those tickets i was able to go and i remember i just went just to see dave lee Rawls because i'd never seen dave live you know never never saw him so i took my son and they had their little special box up there and they had you know shrimp and all this other crap i didn't eat nothing i just we just got went there and watched and dave come out and he had his backup band <clears throat> they sounded just like van halen you know yeah. sounded just like it but you know it wasn't the same and dave was trolling the microphone stand doing all that cool stuff and and the very last song he played was jump in his set and then they couldn't hardly get him off the stage he kept going to each corner of the stage waving at people and doing all this and they finally got him off the stage and then bad company came out and started uh can't get enough and then me and my son we left and we left because uh i just went there to see day i just want to see him one time you know at least i can say yeah. you know and um but you could tell then i was like man it's just not not the same it's just not and i was like man but i got to go for free so i said why not let's just yeah, you know, sure, be a once in a lifetime thing let's go you know so we went and uh had VIP parking and all that crap. I've never, I've never experienced that. And I said, I never will again. So let's just go ahead and right on. I can say that I went, you know, there's a few, few acts that I went to see just to, just for the sake of, uh, I, you know, I wanted to put it in my memory, uh, BB King and buddy guys, one of those acts. well, you know, buddy guys still here, but they were on the same bill and, uh, BB King was the headliner and you know, he's not here anymore. Uh, my wife and I went to go see them. I don't know, man. God, that's been quite some years back. They came here to South Carolina, and it was an outdoor venue, like a amphitheater, but there was no awning, no shelter, no nothing. It was this time of year here. It was blazing hot. And we went there, man, and it was like a – what they call it? The Blues and Barbecue Festival or something like that. Huh. And um, all they sold was a bottle of water like this. I remember my wife said, do you want something to drink? I said, I might get a water, a bottle of water like this, just a regular bottle of water, man. Cost you like, I think it was six bucks. Yeah. Six dollars. Yeah. Six bucks. And then they had the, uh, the tall boy beers, you know, the tall boy cans, 24 ounces. And I think those were going for, I think those were going for like 10 or $12 a pop. Woo. And you can get two for five at the damn grocery store. You know, yeah. and uh, I was like, damn, well, I said, you want something to drink? I said, hell no. I said, I'm not spending that here. So we stayed and they had some opening act, some uh, female blue singer. She's really good. I just, excuse me. I just can't remember. I can't remember what her name has been so long ago. A couple of those acts came out and then when it started, uh, the sun was getting ready to set. Buddy Guy came out and he played. And it was phenomenal. Man, it was phenomenal. And then uh, he got done and then BB came out. And uh, he came out on a wheelchair and he got up and was barely able to walk across the stage to get to his metal fold out chair. And he sat down and him and Lucille, man, in his band. And uh, I think he still had one or two songs to go. And I told my wife, we need to split because if we don't leave now, we'll never get out of here. Yeah. He there was, was stuck people, in the parking lot. There was people everywhere, man. So uh, she said, all right, let's go. So we split. We was able to get out of there before the, the crowd let out. And, uh, there was other people that had that same idea too. There are not many, but a few. And I was like, yeah, I know what they're doing. They're getting out of here. Cause if you don't get out of here now, you won't, you won't get out of here. You, you know? won't get out. But yeah. yeah, there's a few shows, man, that, that I went and I said, you know, I just want to be able to say that I went because, Absolutely. because now, uh, with my schedule nowadays, I can't do anything like that. You know, I'm, I'm working right. nights and the only way I was able to do anything this past week. So I was on vacation this week, you know, and, and, uh, I'll be back in the saddle tomorrow, you know, Sunday. Back to work. Yeah. Start, I got to work tomorrow up. too. I got to uh, pick up some hours tomorrow. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm working a half a day. Hopefully. Awesome. Yeah, man. Not too bad. Awesome deal. Well, uh, is there anything else you want to touch on? We're about out of time here. I've been trying to keep a, a yeah. little bit of time What's here. The time we got, uh, 
just a couple of minutes here, I believe, before the timer runs out on this recording, video recording. So is there anything you want to, you want to promote your channel or anything you want to talk about? No, I mean, everybody just watch my channel for uh, upcoming videos and watch the video I put out uh, today. Today's August uh, 10th, 2019. And uh, I will be on, I believe next week, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday on uh, Dave R's Guitars with uh, Brian Stewart. And I'll be hanging out with those guys. So I'm sure the uh, guitar community will be following along. If not, uh, they'll they'll see the live show and see it. Okay. So, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> pretty much what I have going on. Awesome deal. And if, uh, if y'all will uh, check the links below underneath the description of this video, you will see R2's uh, channel link. In, in there as well. So if you're not familiar with, with R2, R3 Lock and Nut, just scroll down in the description and you'll see, I don't know, five or six channels. And uh, his is in there. Just click on it, subscribe, hit that bell notification so you'll be aware of any videos that he puts up. And you can keep up Thank with you, anything sir. in this, in this, oh, absolutely, in this small guitar community here. And uh, as for me, I am Joe. This is the Joe It's Project TV. Again, thank you to R2 for being here and taking the time. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, and happy birthday to his brother today. Yeah, brother's name is Julian, kind of like Julian Lennon. Julian, there we go. Happy birthday, Julian, man. Happy birthday. Hope you had a great day today. R2 said he's sending you, I think, $500, I think. Let me look over here. <laughs> Let me double check with my accountant. Yep, okay, all right. That looks like that's a green light, Julian. So yep, I believe Jim light. Gidry's got that covered. That, he does. He, that's Jim Gidry's territory, that's right. <laughs> Jim, get on that, man. <laughs> and uh, everybody, thank you for watching. R2, thank you again. It was fun. Man. You, have, to do this, have to do this again. Absolutely, man. Always yeah. a pleasure to be on with you, man. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, all, everybody. And we'll see you next time on the Joe Woods Project TV, where guitars still live and breathe. Take care. Ruggle.